He is called Nusik, Igunat, Agai, and many other names. His power and majesty have been worshipped by the Indians of the Columbia River Basin for centuries. But today, his story is a troubled one. They are Chinook and Sockeye, Coho, Chum, and Steelhead. They have been brought to the brink of extinction by man, and they are now the focus of the most ambitious fish and wildlife restoration program ever conceived. From the time he is born, the salmon is destined to travel. After migrating downstream, they fight the vast northern Pacific from three to five years, moving northward through the Gulf of Alaska, in a great circle that brings them back miraculously to the same rivers from which they came. Then begins the toughest part of their journey, the fight back upstream, navigating by some ancient unknown instinct from stream to stream, fasting in a desperate search for their own birthplace, where they will spawn and die. When Lewis and Clark crossed the Continental Divide, they entered an uncharted part of their new country where few white men had traveled. For the Indians, the most precious treasures were the abundant wildlife which provided food and clothing, the forests which gave them shelter, and the lifeline for this entire ecosystem the mighty Columbia River. Each year, the Columbia and its tributaries would come alive with salmon. For eagles and other natural predators, they meant survival. Many tribes who celebrated their return each year harvested huge baskets of them to store for winter food. But still they came, leaping powerful rapids to blanket the river bottoms from spring to fall. Then with the settlers came a new age of progress, and times began to change. Well, the decline of our salmon runs really started around the turn of the century when our forefathers were thinking that the supply of salmon was pretty much unlimited, and we really geared up to harvest a lot of them. And then, as time went on, and we got into the 30s and building the Bonneville Dam and the other dams since then, and uh, the forestry, building of roads, agriculture demands on water, things of this nature, the decline of the salmon just has been very rapid. But man's attention was focused on development, like Woody Guthrie told the story in song. Uncle Sam, he took the challenge in the year of 33 for the farmers and the workers and for all humanity. Now, River, you can ramble where the sun sets in the sea, but while you're rambling, River, you can do some work for me. Roll, Columbia, won't you roll, roll, roll. Roll, Columbia, won't you roll, roll. The Columbia River Basin stretches 260,000 square miles from the Rockies to the Pacific. At the peak of their abundance, salmon and steelhead runs covered nearly all of this territory. When man began to harness these rivers, he generated billions of watts of power to electrify a growing northwest and millions of acres of croplands in the dry, parched desert. In less than half a century, salmon and steelhead populations in the tens of millions were reduced to mere thousands. Fishermen, Indian and non-Indian alike, began to see their very means of existence disappearing, along with a valuable food source. I quit fishing salmon commercially uh, just because of the economics of it. There wasn't uh, 
got to the point where I couldn't really make a living. I had to fish tuna or crab or something else. So I've seen every dam built, and every year the fishing gets worse and worse and worse. I stood on Ripple, counted 50 and 60 salmon going over Ripple at the same time. The last time I saw it like that was about 20 years ago. Economies of small towns from the Rockies to the Pacific were being drained. The collision course between fishermen and power producers came to a head. And in 1980, Congress passed the Northwest Power Act. It charged the newly formed Northwest Power Planning Council with the creation of a 20-year energy plan and a regional fish and wildlife program to protect, mitigate, and enhance the fish and wildlife resources in the Columbia Basin. The Bonneville Power Administration, with the cooperation of the electric utilities of the region, were called upon to fund these plans to resurrect the world's largest Chinook salmon and steelhead runs. As the act passed, uh, the requirements from Congress were that we develop a special fish and wildlife program in recognition of the declining fish runs on the Columbia. We made it very clear uh, that managing the fish and wildlife program uh, would have to come through a cooperative venture between fish and wildlife agencies and the Indian tribes. Uh, the tribe's overall priorities with the fish and wildlife program are that they see it as the vehicle by which they can implement the the means to rebuild the upriver runs that have been depleted for a number of reasons. Uh, many of those are due to hydroelectric projects. In the past, there have been uh, individual acts that have been meant to mitigate for those losses and to establish means of enhancing the upriver runs. There's never been anything that, that causes the fishery managers and the hydroelectric system operators to deal with the fishery and the fish resource in its entirety. And that's what the tribes see coming out of the Fish and Wildlife Program. After the young salmon hatch, they wait for the spring runoff to swell the rivers and streams that will carry them along their migration to the sea. The great dams not only block their paths, but they hold back the runoff to generate power. Fish ladders were built into some, but they only helped returning adults. It wasn't until the 1960s that scientists began to realize the most devastating impact on the salmon was the loss of juvenile fish trying to move downstream. Now the council has come up with a plan for budgeting flows through the dams during this critical runoff period. The water budget is designed to really do three things, I think. One, and primarily, is to help the fish, to improve the time that it takes for the juvenile salmon to get down the river. Their biological clock tells them that nature expects them to get to the ocean in about 30 days. We built the dams, but we changed the characteristics of the river, so their travel time is something like 60 days, which uh, upsets their biological clock and, and really hurts their survival. The water budget now uh, takes some of the power that we could have produced in the wintertime to heat and light our homes and moves it into the spring when we really don't need the power, but gives that water to the fish and induces an artificial spring freshet, if you will, or restores a portion of the natural freshet so that the little fish can get down to the ocean in their 30 days that they, their body tells them it ought to uh, take them. It also is an explicit trade-off between power and fish and wildlife, which, after all, is one of the purposes of the Power Act. The water budget will provide some relief for the beleaguered runs, but there are other problems. Poor logging practices sometimes block streams altogether. But even more threatening, they allow runoff to clog streams with silt, smothering eggs before they can hatch. Through the Council's plan, stream bank restoration projects are improving salmon habitat in many parts of the basin. Irrigation has made the deserts bloom, but diversion dams can take too much water from streams, leaving valuable spawning grounds high and dry. Washington's Yakima Basin is a prime example of irrigation's productivity. With funds from the Bonneville Power Administration 
And in cooperation with the Bureau of Reclamation, the council is making improvements for fish passage at the dams. The Yakima system has had development since the early 1900s. One of the main problems is the river system or the quantity of water has been over allocated. The two main entities in the Yakima Basin would be the irrigation interest for agriculture and would be the Yakima Indian Nation. Probably their main concern would be the fisheries resource. They've depended on the resource in historic times and they still depend on that resource. We have a number of irrigation diversion dams in the basin and these uh, dams have either non-existent or deficient fish passage facilities. And the suggestions and recommendations that the Yakima Indian Nation made uh, mostly concern uh, those passage facilities. The irrigation people are working with the council on their plan. They're in favor of their plan. And there's an awful lot of effort going on now in the basin to try to meet everybody's needs. Throughout the Columbia system, the council is working with fishery agencies to learn more about the migration of young salmon and steelhead. Smolt are tagged at hatcheries, and a fin is clipped so they can be identified when they return as adults. Brands on others will tell biologists further downstream where the fish began their migration and how they're faring. Smolt are dipped from gate wells at dams, or simply monitored with a sonar system called hydroacoustics to estimate how many are passing by. Still, the critical process is getting them around the dams and on their way to the sea. Going through turbines and over spillways are major causes of death. So the Corps of Engineers began Operation Fish Run to barge them safely through the locks. Once they get to the sea, the journey is no less hazardous. Destined to travel the Pacific sometimes as long as five years, they will find ocean predators even more plentiful, and man is no exception. The demand on this resource is incredible, and the Council is trying to make sure that its efforts to rebuild river runs aren't canceled out by over-harvesting in the ocean. You have a mixed stock situation in the ocean. By that we mean that you have various stocks from various rivers and tributaries, and then superimposed on that, you have hatchery stocks, which can sustain a very heavy harvest. Uh, the Fisheries Council has been wrestling with this problem and have actually been coming up with much more stringent regulations. They've had time and area closures, gear regulations, to try to separate out and harvest the healthy stocks when they're available for harvest, uh, providing as much protection as possible to those stocks they want to preserve and increase their escapement. When instinct tells them the time is right, they return, as they have for centuries, to coastal rivers from Alaska to California in search of their ancestral streams. Once again, their way is blocked by dams. Fish ladders give them a chance to conquer some of these impassable walls, but for all their power and determination, some salmon and steelhead cannot traverse even the most modern ones. Studies to improve them are an ongoing part of the Council's program. The key to their acute navigational instincts remains one of nature's great mysteries. But once they return to fresh water, their entire energy is devoted to the battle upstream. As they return, man once again takes a hand to help restore the depleted runs. Hatchery crews like this one on the South Fork of Idaho's Salmon River trap some of the returning salmon each summer to retrieve their valuable eggs. Female, be a five year old. 
but it is. She's still in good shape, no marks on her. She's not an aspirin fish. But that doesn't mean she's not a hatchery fish. They're not very big now. When they left the ocean, she was double this weight. When they enter the fresh water, they, they don't eat. So they've traveled 750 miles without eating. That's why they've uh, lived off their body reserves gained in the ocean. Some fish are passed by the weir to spawn naturally, but those trapped are kept in holding tanks until they're ready. In order to ensure future salmon runs, the precious eggs are gathered from the females and fertilized. Then they are reared in the hatchery for a full year before being released. Some of the smolt are returned to their native streams but others are outplanted in streams where runs are dangerously depleted or extinct, giving more salmon the chance to make the journey of their ancestors. Without the hatchery runs, we may have a few remnant fish, but uh, we wouldn't have the runs we're getting now. In 1982, we released 185,000. If we got back 500 fish from that, we'd probably be doing pretty good. The council's plan calls for restoring naturally spawning stocks, reprogramming or redistributing existing hatchery stocks from the lower Columbia is the key to rebuilding the upriver runs. Even after we optimize the production of natural spawning fish uh, by restoring habitat, by minimizing the problems, uh, fish passage facilities, even if we control the harvest, do all these good things, I think the demands of society are such that uh, we'll still need more fish. So hatcheries are important to not only restore, but to enhance these wild runs, to produce fish in excess of what the wild runs can produce to meet the needs of society. When the wild salmon return to their home streams to spawn naturally, they must wait for nature to take its course. When the time is right, the females instinctively begin digging a nest in the river bottom to house the nearly 2,000 eggs they each carry. The males choose one of these reds as their territory and will attack any intruders. When the female has completed her nest, she moves upstream and releases her eggs, allowing the gentle current to carry them to their resting place. Sensing that his time has come, the male passes over the red and fertilizes the eggs. Their life cycle at an end, nature reclaims their aging bodies. For them, the journey is over, but for the next generation, the fight for survival is just beginning. Salmon and steelhead are not the only wildlife affected by man's harnessing of rivers and streams, especially in the upper reaches of the basin like western Montana, where huge storage reservoirs have been constructed. The resident fish here face many of the same problems that migratory salmon and steelhead do in the lower Columbia as a result of hydro development throughout the basin. Hundreds of these small hydropower projects are being proposed on streams and tributaries basin-wide. The cumulative impacts on fish and wildlife habitat could be severe. The council is taking steps to ensure that these projects are carefully examined individually and collectively, and that developers are held responsible for any damaged or lost habitat. The Fish and Wildlife Program developed by the Northwest Power Planning Council offers some significant opportunity to improve the impacts caused by hydroelectric development. A few examples would be the flows provided out of Hungry Horse Reservoir to improve the kokanee fishery in the Flathead River uh, and purchase of uh, wildlife uh, lands that were lost by the um, inundation of thousands of acres of white-tailed deer and elk habitat with the construction of the large storage reservoirs like Hungry Horse and Libby. 
Monitoring studies such as this kokanee count on McDonald Creek near Glacier Park keep the council informed on the effects of hydro development on these resident fish. The placement of nesting boxes on Canada goose habitat in many parts of the basin protects nests from fluctuating water levels caused by hydropower projects. These programs and others like them are all part of the council's plan to preserve the wildlife heritage that has always been a part of the Northwest. The council is dedicated to carrying out its program to make restoration of salmon and steelhead runs a reality. Management of the pristine fish and wildlife habitat that remains must continue if their plans are to be realized. I think if there's any one single thing that the council has accomplished through the development of the Fish and Wildlife Program, it's a sense of cooperation by all of the players. They have been willing to alter their traditional likes and dislikes in order to benefit the resource. I am very proud of, of the council's role in that. It's going to be a long effort uh, and a great amount of money is going to be spent in this process. Uh, money that must be spent wisely. Uh, when we will not have results uh, in one or two years. It's a long-term job. Low water years will test the, the viability and the wisdom of the water budget and uh, will create new problems for us there. Uh, there's no great magic to it. It's got to be up to everyone. The council's plan encompasses thousands of miles and many lives. And I think that the act has, uh, has given them the incentive uh, and that includes not only the states but the Indian tribes and the various other federal agencies involved. I think they all know that this is going to be the last chance. But there's a real significant opportunity here to try and direct the future development of hydropower in the Columbia River system. The kind of cumulative impacts that we had from development of reservoirs throughout the system can be avoided in the future by the Council's program to designate critical fish and wildlife habitat, exempt it from uh, any future hydro development, and try and identify and direct development towards those areas which would be relatively benign in terms of its impacts on fish and wildlife. Their indomitable spirit and determination are still being tested by man and by nature. But despite all the odds, the salmon have survived. One of the greatest fishes in the world. It not only fights well, eats well, it, uh, it's as tenacious of life as any animal I've been acquainted with. Uh, they've been doing it for centuries and centuries. They're uh, very adaptable, they're very strong. Uh, they will survive if given any chance at all. It's always been amazing that we get any fish back at all, really. Kind of something special when you get some adults back that you've actually helped raise. I think it would be a real, real crime if we permitted this resource to be lost in the Northwest. To see fish that'll still migrate 900 miles up the Columbia, up the Snake, into some of those tributaries is a sight that you never forget. It's something that my grandchildren will see, hopefully, someday, the salmon in the river. I want to see them come back. And return they will, if the people of the Northwest will support this unprecedented commitment to restore a magnificent renewable resource. The journey of the salmon is a journey we must all undertake in order to save this heritage that is so valuable to us all. <laughs>